celebration, the ceremonial of rejoicing, colonial rule coming to an end in Africa's most populous country. This was Independence Day, the year 1960. The place, Lagos, Nigeria. These pictures tell of pride in self-determination, but there was a shadow behind the joy. Independence had been achieved despite the colonial legacy, not because of it. A legacy which now bequeathed to Nigerians a deeply divided country. It would be many years before the nation achieved true unity. This is the story of that colonial inheritance, why it paved the way for future problems, how Nigerians had fought against colonial rule but were still not free of its imprint. That day, few could have foreseen the struggles that lay ahead, but all knew of the struggles of the past. To find out why Independence Day was just the beginning, the answers lie in Nigeria's history, the very heart of its journey to nationhood. Well before the Europeans arrived, the area that was to become Nigeria had vast resources, almost a million square kilometers at the heart of West Africa. From Atlantic shores to Sahara Desert, and everywhere in between, a country of varied landscapes, of wild and rich vegetation. In the south, a vista of swamps and lagoons, creeks and waterways. Further north, the hilly terrain of the Jos Plateau. A contrast with the hinterland, giving way to savanna bush, merging into the desert. A natural heritage unique in Western Africa. But since early times, it was the rivers that shaped the region's commerce. The two broad rivers that straddled the countryside, the Niger and the Benue. It was here that native traders moved their produce. These were the arteries that made trade possible. River commerce, the lifelines of the region for centuries. People here were divided along tribal lines with a history of great empires and city-states. Fulani and Hauteland in the north, Yorubaland in the west, Iboland in the east. But behind these broad divisions lay a teeming diversity of tribes and peoples, over 250 ethnic groups, hundreds of languages and dialects. Today's Nigerian culture was formed in the centuries before foreign traders came. Geography shaped its cultural diversity. In the north, the pull of Islam and sub-Saharan commerce. Structured societies under kings and emirs, providing security for their traders. Strong hierarchies, organizing all aspects of their kingdom, regulating political life and social and economic customs. Further south and to the east, the vast Niger River Delta with its more diverse societies, its traders traveling a multitude of waterways through thousands of tiny villages. Ruling the villages were councils of elders. There were no kings in these parts. The traders bartered with tribes in the hinterland, fish and salt against vegetables and tools. Further west, the vast centralized kingdoms of the Yoruba and Benin, kingdoms but still diverse peoples. Throughout the area that was to become Nigeria, people lived within the framework of their tribes. Traditional rulers held sway over their people. In most cases, there were no problems of succession, and that made for government. These were the shores to which foreign traders came, first the Portuguese in the 16th century, but by the mid-1800s it was the British presence that had grown the most. Not only traders, but explorers and missionaries also. From coastal outposts they set up trade routes into the interior, 
This gradual opening of trade routes led to direct commerce between African producers and the Europeans. British traders were already infringing on the commerce of native chiefs. As trade grew by 1850, the British government was ready to intervene to secure its profitable centers of trade and carry out commerce on its own terms. In 1851, on the pretext of suppressing the slave trade in Lagos, British gunboats bombarded the city. The British deposed and expelled the king and installed their own friendly ruler. Ten years later, after continuing disorder, they were to annex the city by treaty. The British claimed the treaty was an agreement between two mutually interested parties. I think if one looks at the treaty, and one always has certain doubts about the validity of treaties in the 19th century, but nevertheless, if you look at the treaty, you'll find that they were arguing that we must uh, replace slave trade with legitimate trade. We must protect the Lagosians, the people of Lagos, from the slavers and the kidnappers, and we must develop this excellent site that they have, suggesting it was very much in the interest of Lagosians. But this claim of mutual interest was an illusion. With gunboat diplomacy, the colonization of Nigeria had begun. In annexing Lagos, the British had forced their puppet ruler, Dozunmo, to cede them the city for a thousand pounds a year. It was now a British colony. The Foreign Office set up the deal. Many historians now believe the colonial power had participated actively in slavery before deciding to suppress it for commercial reasons. The British came in the 19th century when they had changed their minds about the slave trade and they no longer considered it economic. And they were at the vanguard of the um, trade against the slave trade. Um, and it was then that they began to take uh, governmental measures, such as the appointment of the consul and um, sending armed uh, troops to. Uh, bombard Lagos and uh, later on to annex the island of Lagos. For the next 40 years, Britain slowly gained complete control of the area, but it was the notorious Treaty of Berlin, signed in 1885, which finally gave the British the right to develop the Niger region as their sphere of influence. The conference and the subsequent treaty were totally European creations. They had nothing to do with the hopes and wishes of African peoples. The conference carved up Africa to suit European trading interests. In Berlin, the British had little trouble convincing the other Europeans that they and their allies had a right to the Niger region. The really cynical aspect of the, of, the, of the whole Berlin conference was that um, whereas um, the British, the French, the Germans, and so on, have been dealing with several African uh, kings and uh, people and signing treaties, and in fact using the breaking of those treaties as excuse to mount expeditionary forces against them. In Berlin, they claimed that uh, Africa was nobody's territory, that they did not recognize any authority, not even the emperor of Ethiopia, uh, who was their ally and so on. And so uh, it was by agreement among European powers that the whole uh, partition process uh, was undertaken. The conference had given the British the green light to organize and protect their trading in the crops of the Niger area. The British wanted to save on costs of administration, so they asked trading companies to administer the areas where they operated. In the north, they were to protect the trade in groundnuts. In the west, the export crops were rubber, cotton, and cocoa, and in the Niger Delta, it was palm oil for European soaps and creams that made the traders wealthy. And so the system of protectorates took root in Nigeria towards the end of the 19th century. It was a system that was to further British trading interests, and it was open to abuse. When in 1886, the Royal Niger Company was granted a charter to administer its area, 
it was told not to seek trade monopolies, and yet it did just that, while consolidating British influence and control. The company, under Sir George Goldie, was accused of using its charter to set up a monopoly. It excluded local traders through heavy fines and fees for administration. Another cynical aspect of this was that they were talking in terms of the, in terms of um, free nav navigation from the Niger and the Congo. Whereas, in fact, Goldie, who was the one uh, running around, was in fact at that particular time busy uh, consolidating his monopoly and excluding even African traders who had pioneered the trade on the Niger. So that by the end of, of, of this, uh, he managed to obtain the charter uh, to go around this place and uh, to, to, to get to of everybody else. By now, many Nigerian chiefs were under pressure to sign treaties accepting British rule. British representatives would depose chiefs who refused to cooperate. But there was opposition as local rulers sought to protect their trading interests. The story of Jar Jar of Opobu symbolized the repression faced by native rulers who refused to toe the line. But it also showed the depth of resistance. Jar Jar's business acumen annoyed the British. He was so shrewd uh, a trader that he very uh, easily uh, took um, a lot of the markets that Bonnie Chief used to, used to run. And he proceeded to establish his own uh, year of, of, of trade and uh, proceeded to exclude uh, all the British traders who would not deal directly with him and wanted to either deal with, with uh, other houses in Bonny or wanted to themselves to go uh, to trade directly with the people. And it was because of this that he fell foul of the British and uh, he was kicked and body escaped and uh, taken to the, to the Gold Coast where he was. Uh, and exiled. 